All right, let's get started. So this is the LaRouche Pack Saturday evening discussion in class. Uh, I'll be your host tonight, Mike Steger. We've got um, Ben Deniston continuing his, which could be, I think, a four or more part series on the questions of um, man's action on really on the planet and within the, within the solar system, dealing with the questions of climate change, economic development. And I think tonight we're in for a treat because Ben's been kind of developing this kind of in shells of expanding significance. And tonight we're getting at a, a much larger kind of broader scope of what he touched on last week. Let me just set the stage for tonight's discussion with two reflections of which for many of you that have been around a few decades will have a reference point for in terms of how dramatic um, the last 50 or 60 years have been. The first, of course, as many of you know, we are now having pulled out of Afghanistan in a bit of a incompetent way, as everything the Biden collective does is incompetent, whether it's the border, the CRT policy, defunding the police, many of these things they've just had to outright deny, reject, walk back, but the incompetence continues. Um, it's worth noting, President Trump actually had the courage, almost unlike any other statesman of our time, to invite the Taliban to come and meet with him to figure out if they could actually establish a real relationship, real terms by which this process would unfold. Now, that meeting didn't happen. It was shut down by people in the Pentagon, inside the administration, in the uh, security complex. Um, but what we see today is reminiscent. In some ways, it's a bookend with 3,000 troops now going into Kabul, emergency um, removal of embassy staff of what took place in April 75 in Saigon. Now that war, the Vietnam War, was at least one of where it, with intense conflict that was approximately a decade. You could say it was a little bit longer. It's undeniable to say that this war, the Afghan deployment, was now near 20 years. And the level of suffering, as was pointed out in ongoing discussions, despite the loss of limbs, of mind, of mental health, family losses, the economic draining of trillions of dollars, to, to chase some terrorists located in the caves of Afghanistan, which were sponsored, as we know, both by the Saudis and by British intelligence directly, that um, 60,000 soldiers, veterans, have committed suicide in our own country. let alone the, the, the many of them or of their brothers and sisters or of the many Americans who have also lost their life or committed suicide by the, what they've now been termed the diseases of despair, but the opioid crisis, alcoholism, the increasing kind of loss of mission, of purpose, of value for our nation and for its citizens, its individuals, and really of human beings in general. Because as we know, with the tens of thousands that have been lost in these wars since 9-11, there's been millions of innocents killed around the world under the name of Operation Freedom and massive uh, violations of our own constitution under Orwellian terms like the Patriot Act. But this also is a bookend or perhaps an inflection point because the bankruptcy of this establishment, the bankruptcy of this complex is now for all to see. And perhaps there's no better represent, representative of that than the senile man in the White House, Joe Biden. His senility expresses the kind of delusional nature we've been operating for this many years. And I would I'd point people, there was a, re, a major expose during the Vietnam War called the Pentagon Papers. And many of people know of those, it was made public by Senator Mike Gravel, it was whistleblowing by Daniel Ellsberg, but if you ever read them, even the first page of a five-volume five collection, it was a question of what is the nature and what is the problem that we're facing in Vietnam? Why is this not a successful policy? 
what are the troubles we're running into? Push, you know, research by the Rand Corporation. In the very first paragraph, they identify a change of course of traditional American outlook to support national movements, national governments against colonial powers, whether it be Japanese or French in Vietnam. And that that policy shift took place in 1945. And we are now reaping what these elites have sown for now 75 plus years. And it's now time to fundamentally change that. That's what the LaRouche movement has been oriented towards for over 50 years. And it's time to bring that to bear. The other kind of moment we're reaching, which is the Ides of August, and this year, 50 years ago, this day, 50 years ago, tomorrow, 1971, August 15th, you had probably the greatest shift away from a production-oriented society into a full adoption of the neoliberalism of globalization. Full, sco full, full scope deregulation of the financial markets, massive creation of speculative of options, derivative puts, you name it, in terms of financial markets, but a financialization of the US economy, a reduction of the American citizen to some kind of uh, consumer, on the farm of globalization and a, and, a, and a destruction of our investments into infrastructure, ind industry, science, with the adoption of cults like environmentalism, you know, that worship things such as less consumption. You know, less consumption should and is known by anyone with a brain as called poverty. If you're consuming very little, you're poor. We're not looking to create in massive poverty. The environmental movement, that's its actual intention, poverty and reduction of human life. But that's been the last 50 years. The inflection point is 50 years um, from tomorrow, yesterday, you know, ago, tomorrow. So in some sense, the question is not the past. All of us sitting in this discussion or watching on YouTube are familiar with the past. The question is, what do we do into the future? So I just want to give people a quick insight into our quick review, reference, especially for those that might be on watching this on YouTube to continue to uh, check out and watch what's happening on the larouchepack.com website. We've got our fall offensive, which is now posted at the headline. We've got activity on the recall election, which is an ongoing process. And Gavin Newsom is panicked in California. They're threatening to bring in Biden and Harris to seal the deal on his destruction, his downfall. We'll see if they do it. Um, there's also a plan for a massive voter fraud, not surprising. But this is a real engagement, and it's, it typifies what's taking place around the country from grassroots layers, rejecting the Republican Party, rejecting this entire bureaucracy, recognizing that it's our country. It's not the, the state governments don't control the nation. We, the people, do. And that's the kind of engagement we're finding. And so I think people should check out the fall offensive. We've got an update on a fusion company, major breakthroughs in terms of approaches and creative ideas. And if you haven't yet read the LaRouche Pack Citizens Primer and you're out there organizing, if you're gonna be hitting the Trump rally next Saturday in Alabama, you should be printing these, getting them out to your family and friends and engaging them in how we're going to shape the next 50 years, the next 75 years. Because what has been lost to a large extent has been that. So check out the LaRouche Pack website, stay engaged, get on our email lists, participate in these Zoom discussions live, with live back and forth discussion and questions and answers. And the main point is let's discuss how we're going to shape the next 75 years um, as real human beings, as real citizens, and as real producers. So Ben, I think that's your subject, so I'll hand it off to you. Thanks, Mike. Glad to be on again. Uh, we should have a fun discussion tonight. I think Mike situated things pretty well. Um, so I'm going to pretty much pick up right off of where we left off last week. Um, I'm just going to jump right in my, into my slides here, so give me a brief second for that. So the discussion tonight is what controls the climate, and we'll give you a hint. It's not your CO2 emissions, and I'm sure many of you, many of our audience is aware of that, the overblown hype around human CO2 emissions, their effect on the climate, and so on. Um, we also discussed the, 
reality of that policy as a whole, the Green New Deal, um, and just how devastating that policy would be uh, for the economy, mass enforced switch to wind, solar power, shutting down a fossil fuel, shutting down nuclear power, and so on, would just be absolutely catastrophic for the US economy. Um, even worse for the global economy, especially developing nations that desperately need cheap, abundant sources of power. And today we're going to get into a little bit more on the side of science, the real science of the matter. So last week's discussion, this week's discussion is kind of part of a continuity. Last week really hit hard at the Western drought and the solutions to it and highlighted in particular new technologies of weather modification, not going beyond the existing technologies of cloud seeding and looking at atmospheric ionization technologies uh, and what those can do and what those have already have already what has already been done with those technologies to solve droughts, to fill reservoirs, to increase precipitation where it's needed, even to control forest fires, to help fight um, actual pollution, which is not CO2, but you know, particulate pollution in the atmosphere um, in major cities, which is an issue in certain places in the world. Um, very exciting new technology, uh, but it has a very important scientific connection into a real science of climate change. What has been termed by some cosmoclimatology. Climatology as in relation to the cosmos, the Earth's climate and its connection to the cosmos. And we're gonna compare that with some of the craziness we're seeing from these climate models and all the scare media stories now being put out in the context of the IPCC releasing their new report and pushing for a new, um, a new round of propaganda campaigns to scare people into this globalist program. But we wanna get a little deeper into that and get at some of the issues of the real fundamental science. We, we, what Mr. LaRouche might say, the issues of science per se, outside of these particular expressions. And so I wanted to start off by just putting it in this context. And this might be a little bit deeper than, um, than some of our earlier discussions, but I think it's important to really fight with some of these issues. I mean, this is something that I know from my personal work with Mr. LaRouche, it was probably one of, if not his most impassioned areas of study um, and investigation, which is science, scientific method or epistemology, or what some people today might call the philosophy of science, although I don't know if you really like that term necessarily. But not just saying, yay science, yay science, um, but looking at well, what makes science work, when does it work, when does it not work, what are the different approaches, what are the different methodologies? And there's an incredibly rich and important history there. Um, which Mr. LaRouche and fights and political fights, which we'll get into a little bit. I mean, it's a really big subject. You know, we're just gonna kind of dovetail it as it intersects the, the subject of climate change and the broader discussion around that. But this is a uh, very big, very important issue that really goes a lot deeper than much of what uh, people are fighting on today on both sides. So we hear, you know, We've all heard this, follow the science. We've heard it on the climate issue for years, decades. We've heard it around the pandemic, right? Some jackass on the media, mass media gets up and says, follow the science, follow the science, follow the science. And there's no presentation as to what the, what the science behind those conclusions actually are. They're just telling you to follow orders. Just do what the supposed authorities say, right? If Dr. Fauci says masks don't work, follow the science, masks don't work. Don't question it, just do it. If one month later, Dr. Fauci says you need three masks, because the more masks you have, the better, don't question that, now follow that, right? Just follow the science. Don't actually think for yourself. Don't ask for the reasoning leading up to these conclusions. This is what the authorities say, you're just supposed to follow it. Again, we're all familiar with that kind of narrative, that kind of approach that's been taken towards attempting to mass manipulate, mass control, mass nudge the US population in the direction they want. But there's a, a few layers to this. There's the obvious, just straight political propaganda, right? I think most followers of LaRouche Pack are pretty familiar with this and 
you know, familiar with how the supposed authority of science is used for just political propaganda pur purposes. But there is a deeper issue, uh, a sp specific type of scientific method or approach to science, which has been at the heart of a fundamental conflict throughout the history of Western civilization. And this is where Mr. LaRouche dedicated much of his life and huge amounts of passion to uh, continuing this fight, understanding this fight, and attempting to move society in, in the right direction on these fundamental issues. This was the kind of central basis for the work I did with him in what we called the basement project, his scientific team. And a lot of it was on these, these fundamental issues. So the problem with what we're seeing under the name of science today, again, outside of just straight political lies, political propaganda, is a type of science which is a certain philosophical outlook. It's a certain ideological outlook. It's not all of science. What Most of what you get today in science is a certain approach which goes contrary to the approach that actually paved the way for the development of modern society. And you can call this reductionism. You could call this empiricism. Uh, you could call this the mathematization of science, which Mr. LaRouche talked a lot about. And, you know, each of those, you know, kind of has their own definition, but there's an intersection between those ideas of a empiricist reductionist approach to what we call science. And if you wanted to try and put a very quick, you know, definition to it, you know, there's, there's a belief, a view that you can have a complete logical or formal consistency across all levels of science and all the way down to human, human sense perception, that our knowledge of the universe, science, comes down to our empirical observations, developing conclusions based on that and developing, under their view, a completely logically consistent and coherent um, axiomatic framework from certain so-called supposedly fundamental aspects of physics and the physical universe all the way up throughout every, uh, everything we investigate in the natural world, right? To highlight one particular expression of this, which hopefully will make it a little bit clearer, was the case of Newton, Newton's work on gravitation, but also the, the expansion of Newton's work and how other people took Newton, Newton's work, you know, what might, what might be called the Newtonian outlook or Newtonianism, and expanding that as the expression of science and scientific method in their view. And probably the best expression of this is the work of Laplace, another scientific thinker um, who came up with this idea of Laplace's demon based on the Newtonian outlook. And this should give you an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about reductionism, where he famously said, if he put it in the context of this, this demon, Laplace's demon, said if there, if there could be some super intelligent being in the universe that could know every position of every particle in the universe, right? Think like an atomic particle, right? Smallest particles that build up the universe, supposedly. If something could know every single position of every particle and its velocity and its velocity and the forces uh, acting on it, then the entire, and you just knew that for a snapshot, a single second, millisecond, in, instantaneous point in time, that just knowing the position and velocity and associated forces acting on these particles of every single particle in the universe, then from that you could extrapolate everything into the past and everything into the future. That everything we know about the universe comes down to these uh, cumulative pairwise interactions of the smallest constituent particle parts of the universe and everything is just built up from there. Um, you know, this, this also introduced ideas, of, I guess there's no free will then, because this is causality, this determines everything in the universe is just how these tiny little balls are pulling on each other and bumping into each other. 
that is the fundamental causality of everything in the universe. Everything just comes as a product of that. And therefore, you know, everything we experience from the stars to the planets to life in general, the human life to human cognition, emotions, thoughts, hypotheses is all just a product of this ultimately these pairwise interactions of these tiny particles pulling and bumping on the, in, into each other, right? Complete uh, formal logical consistency in terms of causality across all these levels of science. And you just say it all comes down to these supposed fundamental building blocks. And it's also interesting to note that Adam Smith, uh, our opponent in the American Revolution, right? Certainly not somebody to be praised today, uh, which unfortunately is a point of confusion for many Americans today. He saw himself as doing to economics what, what, what Newton did to the natural sciences. He viewed himself as a direct continuity of Newton and Newtonianism, Newtonianism as applying it to economics, i.e. taking this reductionist approach and developing an economic science around that type of reductionist approach. Now contrast that with what Mr. Lurus would often term a top-down approach. And this is something that you can see in the work of many great thinkers. This isn't supposed to be an all, all uh, complete list and different of these geniuses, you know, had different insights, um, but all of them very much had a non-reductionist, anti-reductionist approach to science. And they all furthered science and furthered human knowledge and furthered mankind in general through their work based on that uh, non-reductionist approach. You could go all the way back to Plato and Socrates. You see it in their work. You could see it in the work of Nicholas of Cusa. You could see it in the work of his follower, Johannes Kepler, the discoverer of gravitation. You see it very clearly in the work of Leibniz. Um, if you look closely at some of the work of Bernard Riemann and you look at some of his philosophical writings um, and his work on physics and his thoughts on physics and philosophy outside of, you know, most people know him as more of a mathematician, look at his mathematical works, but if you look at his philosophical outlook, which obviously shaped how he thought in general, which became some, the basis for some of his math mathematical discoveries, you see uh, this kind of anti-reductionist approach in his work. Um, Albert Einstein, there's some very fascinating insights he provides um, into these questions of fundamental scientific method and the problems of reductionism as they were being expressed in quantum physics and the anomalies and, and the roadblocks that are coming up against in quantum physics. Um, Vladimir Vernatsky, a Russian scientist, provided some very useful insights in furthering non-reductionist science. We'll get back into him a little bit. And of course, Mr. LaRouche's work uh, as applied in, econ in economics, the science of physical economy, but also in his own writings where he covered and discussed and elaborated and really drew new connections and new insights into this entire historical arc of the development of modern science, the fights between reductionist approaches and non-reductionist approaches um, and so on. And if I were to try and give a quick definition of a non, of a top-down approach, um, I would put it like this. I would say we want to start from what we know about the universe as a whole, including the existence and the nature of mankind as part of that universe, within that universe. And if you want to begin an investigation of science and scientific investigations, you start from there. You start with the universe as a totality. What what do we know about the universe in its whole? Well, mankind is a part of that. And mankind does certain things. When we say the existence and nature of mankind, I mean something specific by that. Mankind's capability to discover the unsensible physical laws or physical principles governing the universe and utilize that knowledge to increase the potential relative population density of society. It might be a little bit of a mouthful, but we're talking about something unique to mankind. You don't see expressed in any other form of life. You don't see animal life doing this. But mankind has a certain capability to discover 
principles of organization of the universe. Think about gravitation, for example, and utilize that understanding, something you can't sense, something you can't experience, but somehow the human mind can hypothesize, create conceptions that uh, become valid expressions or uh, uh, encapsulations of this physical principle of physical action in the universe. And then we can conform our behavior, our actions, our activities to correspond to that. And we can change our relation to the universe. We can, uh, if you want a concrete example, we can increase the carrying capacity of our population on this planet and beyond as a function of that type of action, right? That's something no animal species can do. So, bring this back around to what we're going to get into, right? We're all bombarded with this idea of follow the science. Now the IPCC says this, the IPCC says that, uh, uh, Dr. Lord praise Lord Fauci says this, you're just supposed to get in line, right? And follow that. And so in breaking down what many people just have a innate distrust of that approach and what's been given to them, um, which is very healthy, um, but beyond just the political propaganda aspect is this deeper <clears throat> corruption of science and the kind of the unfortunate dominance of a particular reductionist approach to science, which is probably ultimately more problematic, more dangerous in the long term to the future of civilization than even just this political propaganda Use, usage of the authority of supposed science to try and force people to compel, to, to comply with their desires. Because you're not just trying to boondoggle people by saying this is what the authorities say. You're actually corrupting their ability to come to real valid conclusions and valid scientific reasoning by indoctrinating them with this reductionist or mathematical approach to science. So with that in mind, look at this. We've all seen this, the, the, the IPCC is a new report. And what do you know? It says things are worse than they ever were. You know, we can always rely on The Economist, a, a wonderful source um, of unbiased assessments of these types of things. The, the Economist is now telling us the IPCC delivers its starkest warning yet about climate change, right? And I think, you know, there's, there's plenty of people pulling the report apart chapter by chapter, section by section, you know, um, fighting over, debating over the particular predicates they're talking about. You know, I think it's worth looking at this latest round of scare stories coming out in the media in the context of a longer, uh, longer history of what the IPCC has been doing, <coughs> what related um, political factions have been doing that just shows these guys have been discredited for, for not even years, decades already. I mean, I'm, I'm never going to forget the, the hockey stick from, you know, 20 years ago now where the IPC with IPCC was running around shoving this graph in your face saying, if you look at the last thousand years, it was we see depicted on the right here, um, the climate's been stable and steady, and then only in the last century, only in the 20th century, we see this huge up increase in, in, in temperature, uh, which deviates from this flat, natural climate that's happened over the past 900 years before that. So it just must be the, the impact of human, human CO2 emissions, human greenhouse gases, because that's the only new factor that's, that's occurred. Well, if you go back earlier, the IPCC itself didn't depict the past thousand years of climate that way them, and, and themselves anyway. They recognized the medieval warm period, which was significantly warmer than this average trend. They recognized this, the little ice age coming after that. And they recognized very clearly, the science had shown that there's natural vari variability in the climate, which is significant, even on this time scale of the past thousand years. And if you accept that, if you realize that, then that means that just because the climate's been changing the last century, there's no reason to assume or, or, or 
uh, definitively state that that's not part of a natural set of variations as well, right? So this is a total fraud and was shown that the, the, the very statistics that was used to produce this study would produce this kind of hockey stick shape of a curve uh, showing a, flat, a flattening out and averaging out of all past trends and a steep, steep upward trend in the more recent section of the data. If you just gave it any random data set, it would do that. If you gave it a series of random data, they literally showed this. If you give it a series of random data sets, it'll produce exactly this characteristic curve, right? But then this was you know, shoved in our face as definitive proof. And more recent studies you can see here uh, have confirmed what was known before, before the hockey stick, that you have significant variability in the climate in even the past thousand years in this period, right? So the hockey stick, big fraud, you know, huge discrediting and showing what the IPCC really was doing, is still doing, has been doing and is still doing, which is putting out propaganda under the name of science to push their objective, right? And there's a lot we could go through. I'm just gonna highlight another thing that was, I think has probably fallen off the radar for a lot of people, but there was a big hubbub in 2015 where, where it came out, it showed that NOAA was going back and doing so-called adjustments to historical data for the climate of the United States. And if you compare the, the period from 2001 to 2015, they went back and systematically made the records of temperature from the earlier periods, adjusted those to be cooler, to be colder. And the more recent periods, they adjusted those historical records to, to be warmer. And they said, oh, well, these, well, these are just adjustments we do just because we have better insights into how to average the temperatures of the planet and all this stuff. And what do you know? Lo and behold, when they do it, it happens to accentuate and make the rate of warming appear twice as appear as if it was twice as uh, extreme as the same data had supposedly showed before, right? And there were other other cases similar to this, but just more evidence of you know in this case not the IPCC directly, but NOAA under the direction of climate change fanatics uh, adjusting data to make uh, temperature trends look worse than they had looked before, right? So I would put those under the category of political propaganda. To look a little bit about at the expression of this issue of scientific method and reductionism and the destruction and the loss of insights into a top-down uh, approach to science, I think we have that very clearly. If you look at how much, how, how much people are relying on these climate models, so this is something that some people might have seen before. This is work that's been done by Dr. John Christie. He's a professor at uh, University of Huntsville, Huntsville, Alabama. He's been studying climate for decades. Um, he's a well-established uh, professor there. And this is part of a series of studies that he's been doing for years, comparing what the climate models have been predicting against the reality of uh, what's actually been happening in the climate. So this might look like a big jumbled mess when you first see it, but what we have here is uh, a few dozen different climate models, all being set to run from uh, 1979, basically, and then running them under the conditions of CO2 input in the atmosphere and whatever other conditions um, they determine relevant, running all those models. <clears throat> and all of the models, and, uh, and as you can see in the dark, the, the bolder, the, the larger red line in the middle there, the average of all of the models shows uh, significantly higher, uh, they all forecast far, far higher rates of warming due to the effect of human CO2 emissions than has actually occurred since uh, over this time period, right? In the green there, in the green line, we see uh, atmospheric balloon direct measurements 
um, of this particular part of the atmosphere the study is focusing on, these climate models are focusing on, and we can see a far, let, far smaller uh, rate of warming has actually occurred compared to what these climate models um, had would show. And these are, the, these are the models being used by the IPCC. Um, so in terms of specifics, the average of all of these models are showing a rate of war are predicting, they're forecasting, they're claiming we're going to see a rate of warming of almost one half of one degree per decade, 0.44 degrees Celsius per decade. That's the average of, of what all these models have given us. And then in reality, over the same 40 year time span, the actual climate, the actual records of Earth's temperature um, show less than half of that almost down to a third of that, 0.16 degrees Celsius warming per decade, right? So these models have been proven wrong over and over and over again. They're way over exaggerating uh, uh, the warming trend, the effects of CO2, the effects of human CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and this is a lot of the basis for the economist and other um, terrible mass media outlets to put out these scare story headlines to try and scare everybody into, into action. This is just another depiction of the same, um, the same difference between what the climate models had shown and what's actually happened. And there's some recognition of this, but it's very in, in the scientific community, but it's, it's very much suppressed and very much, um, you know, not, the not at the rate of exposure that's needed. Um, this is a recent article um, in Science Magazine. Uh, UN climate panel confronts implausibly hot forecasts of future warming. So even within, you know, if you actually get into some of the more nuanced scientific discussion and debate, there's there's a lot of recognition that these climate models have been ridiculous. Um, they've not been right. They've consistently been wrong. Um, but you're not seeing The Economist and other, and John Kerry and Biden and all these people that are pushing this, um, uh, this whole narrative. You're not seeing them, you know, caring about the, the scientific debate and the demonstration of how fraudulent these climate models have been. Um, and just to give a little bit of an insight into so what we're talking about here. So we know there's a greenhouse effect, obviously, right? We know human CO2 emissions contribute to that greenhouse effect. There's not a big debate about that. Um, that's established. When you make this leap and you begin to introduce these models to then say, well, how much of an effect is human CO2, is human CO2 emissions, they're adding to the greenhouse effect, how much is that gonna affect the overall totality of the climate system as a whole? That is a completely different question. And that gets into the problems of scientific approach that we really have, a reductionist approach to science. You're dealing with a highly complex dynamic system uh, which I would say cannot be modeled the way they're trying to model, it, right? You have the greenhouse effect, you have atmospheric circulation, you have the Coriolis effect, you have all kinds of variations of large scale atmospheric patterns due to the rotation of the earth. You have smaller patterns of that atmospheric or vertical up and down flows of heat and energy. You have issues of cloud formation. How do they occur? When do they occur? Under what, con what conditions does cloud formation increase or decrease? What types of clouds is very significant, right? You have the entire ocean system, which is highly complex, has its own uh, short-term cycles, long-term cycles, which are known to have effects on the climate and are probably not all fully understood by any means. You have the biosphere itself, which has a dramatic impact on the, the geochemistry of the earth, the chemistry of the atmosphere. You have variations in solar activity, and you have inputs from our galaxy and you have other factors, right? And it's not just a list of factors, it's a list of factors that all inter interconnect, interplay, have feedback on each other, right? 
So if you're trying to Newtonian style build up component by component by component, piece by piece by piece, interaction by interaction, some kind of coherent model built from the ground up, bottom up of the Earth's climate system, no wonder you're getting these models that just fail, fail, and fail. This is a completely different domain of science than something, something as simple as uh, you know, sunlight, uh, infrared radiation interacting with CO2 molecules, right? Um, studying the greenhouse effect, studying how uh, uh, you know, CO2 acts in the Earth's atmosphere in, ter in terms of just kind of a uh, molecular energetic interaction with, with uh, electromagnetic radiation, right? You're leaping from that kind of relatively simple basic physics to then a highly complex, highly dynamic, highly interconnected system with many uh, factors intersecting and interplaying to produce the climate as a totality, right? So I would argue that you see an absolute failure methodologically even outside of the propaganda, we know about the propaganda, we know about the lies being put out. But methodologically, you see an expression of the destruction of real science, real scientific thought through the dominance of this kind of reductionist approach. And to get into a better approach to the science of climate, the science of climate change, I just wanted to take a couple uh, historical records here, hopefully not get, get it too lost in, in too many graphs here, but I just wanted to show three different time periods in terms of what we see historically in the historical records, in the geological records, in terms of the, the relation between CO2 in the atmosphere, the sea levels of CO2 concentration, and the Earth's uh, average temperature. Well, if we take the last 2,000 years, as we see depicted here, I don't see a relation. You have the, the variations in CO2 emissions at the top there, and you have uh, temperature in red varying in ways that looks to have no correspondence at all to the, to the CO2 levels, right? So where's the evidence that changes in CO2 levels in the atmosphere is some kind of major determining factor that's gonna drive the climate into new extremes and the new conditions? You don't see it in this record you do see a very clear relation between temperature and galactic cosmic radiation flux, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, if you're around my age, you probably, you were probably tortured with Al Gore's inconvenient truth propaganda science fiction movie, whenever the hell that came out in the 90s, early 2000s, whenever that was, right? And he famously showed uh, a variation of this graph not looking at you know the last one we were looking at the last 2,000 years or so. Here we're looking at the last 600,000 600, years, right? So good chunk of a longer time scale, um, just over the last half million years. And what we see here is the ebb and flow between ice ages and interglacial periods, right? Which is characterized, which has really characterized the Earth for the last uh, half million years here. And you see here a very close relation on this time scale at this resolution between CO2 and temperature. And Al Gore told us all, hey, there it is. Uh, this proves it that you know CO2 is driving temperature, that changes in CO2 and changes in temperature are so connected, so interconnected, we can see it clearly on this graph. But almost immediately, people who actually looked at the, the data going into this said, well, wait a minute. The changes in the, in the temperature happened before the changes in the CO2. The temperature changes occurred first and the CO2 changes occurred after. And they showed that this was, this was the effect of an overall uh, warming and cooling of the planet between the ice ages and interglacials, which had an effect on how warm the ocean was, which changed how much CO2 could be absorbed and stored in the ocean which is a very well-known phenomenon uh, in terms of the, the temperature of the liquid determining how much of a gas like CO2 can, can uh, be, be dissolved and uh, kept in a, in a body of water. So this actually 
does this shows the opposite. This shows that CO2 is responding to the temperature, not the other way around. No evidence that CO2 is some major driver of climate and changes in CO2 is going to ensure that the climate changes. In this, it shows the opposite. And then just to jump one more time scale, um, again, you know, I apologize for a number of graphs here, but this one is a relatively simplified attempt to estimate. Uh, now we're looking at the last 500 million years, right? So we're jumping from hundreds of thousands of years to hundreds of millions of years, right? So this is like the whole time period in which we've had multicellular complex life on this planet. It's like going all the way back to the Cambrian explosion, the beginning emergence of, of modern uh, advanced life, multicellular life, right? Um, this entire time period, uh, and we see no, no relation to between the, the estimates of the temperature variation on the planet at this time and CO2 records, right? CO2 is going up and down uh, in four major cycles here. CO2 uh, is not showing any relation to that. So the temperature seems to be changing irregardless of what the CO2 levels are on this larger time scale, right? So no evidence from the actual geological records, from the historical records, uh, that CO2 is a major driver of the climate. We do see extensive evidence on many different time scales that the climate, that climate change, that variations in the Earth's climate seems to be largely driven by a, an array of cosmic factors. And this has been named by certain scientists uh, going back to the work of Heinrich Spensmark, some of his associates, I'm actually not sure exactly who gave it this particular name, but cosmoclimatology, looking at the relation between the sun, solar activity, our galaxy, uh, the position of our solar system within the galaxy, how active the galaxy is, recognizing that these have significant factors, uh, these are significant factors that have major impact influence on the Earth's climate over time. Um, just to give a, a bit of a sense of this, here is a little bit of a funny illustration, but this is, again, the same time period that we were just looking at the last 500 million years, right? The last half billion years, um, the period in which complex life has emerged and been dominant on the planet. But it's kind of broken down in like a quasi logarithmic time scale in terms of time, right? The, the time scale is not completely linear. If we start to the left, we're kind of jumping by 50 million year increments. And then as we get into the next panel, all of a sudden we're jumping by 10 million year increments, and then 1 million year increments, and then 250,000 year increments, and then 5,000 and 1,000 year increments, right? So it's a way to kind of show all in one graph, long time scales, uh, medium time scales, if you want to call them that, and shorter time scales. And what we see, according to the work of Spence Mark and, and others working in the area of climate, cosmoclimatology is we're about to look at, the largest variations we see over these hundreds of millions of year timescales is from the influence of our position in the galaxy is a galactic effect. And we can see the scale of those changes in the climate system, right? We're talking about periods in which for tens, hundreds of millions of years, there's no ice caps on the earth at all, no glaciation, no ice covering uh, Greenland, no ice cap on Antarctica, obviously all the continents have moved around and all that. Um, but you know, if you were to picture those in the same places over these different time periods, you have entire periods where there's no glaciation at all. Um, completely different than what, we're, what we see currently, right? And then we also see periods of far more, uh, far colder, more intense types of um, uh, uh, ice ages, um, in these large swings as well. If you look in this, so that, that relates, I'm about to look at, that relates to the changing position of our solar system within the galaxy. 
you look at the kind of medium time scale here, you're talking about not tens and hundreds of millions of years, but you're talking about hundreds of thousands to maybe a million year time scales, right? We see that the big influence on climate change and most, and most specifically, the shifts between uh, interglacials and ice ages over, you know, 100,000 year, 10,000 year, uh, trading off 100,000 year, 10,000 year increments, which I think, you know, people are probably a little more familiar with, right? We're in an interglacial now. We emerged from uh, an ice age, the last ice age, we think around what, 10, 10 12,000 years ago or so, right? Uh, these changes, these shifts between ice age, interglacial, as far as we can ascertain, the best evidence seems to be this, this pertains to changes in the uh, way the earth orbits the sun changes in, in a number of a uh, handful of factors in how that orbiting works. The inclination of the Earth, how eccentric the orbit is, um, the, where the, uh, how the perihelion and aphelion intersect with the, the direction of the inclination angle. Um, so it's really a kind of a solar system phenomenon. And then if you jump, jump into time scales with shorter than that within that, thousands of years, hundreds of years, we see a significant impact from changes in solar activity being a major factor driving changes in the Earth's climate. And obviously there's other factors, there's ocean currents, there's kind of longer term ocean cycles, um, which seem to be very significant changes in the biosphere's activity and you get all kinds of things, volcanic activity, you know, even, even periodic random things like uh, impacts of comets or asteroids, right? Those can obviously play an, play an effect. Um, but just on kind of on this broad top-down scale, you kind of see this hierarchy of causality and intensity of effect where the galactic input is the most significant, less significant than that is the, the solar system relation as a whole. So not just what the sun is doing, but how the earth's orbit relates to the sun, right? And then within that shorter time scale and smaller effect, we see variations uh, in the sun itself, what the sun is doing, how intense the, the solar activity is. So just to look at these particular cases just briefly. So on this galactic scale, we were just looking at um, what we see is that the orbit of the solar system around the galaxy uh, involves the solar system passing through the spiral arms of the galaxy. And what we see is that our best understanding of when those spiral arm passages occurred and the expected and also um, recorded changes in the intensity of galactic radiation, how intense the radiation environment in the galaxy is in those spiral, arm, spiral arms corresponds to this uh, largest of the climate, change, the climate change factors we were just looking at, right? And we can get in, into more of this. People are curious about all the, all the evidence going into this study, uh, but it's fascinating stuff. If we jump all the way down to the uh, shorter time scales, uh, say, you know, human lifespan, decade, decade type time scales. Um, I'm sure many people are familiar with the 11 year solar cycle. Uh, variations in the amount of which, which is also sometimes measured by variations in the amount of sunspots that you can see observed on the sun. Uh, here we see a series of images of the sun taken over an 11 year time period, 10 year time period by a Japanese telescope that was imaging in uh, part of the X ray spectrum. And so each of these images of the sun is about a year apart. And we can see a dramatic variation in how active the sun is. Um, something you can't see just by looking at the sun, which usually you don't want to do. You can look at it during a sunset or sunrise, right? But you don't want to go look at it in the middle of the, middle of the day, obviously, right? But if you're just looking with your eyes in the, in the visual spectrum, the best indication you have of this variation in activity comes from sunspots. But if you look in different parts of the spectrum, x-rays, ultraviolet, radio, uh, we see a dramatic variation in what the sun's doing 
on an 11 year cycle. So here's an indication, one series of images showing one of these cycles where you can see the sun starts highly active, gets less and less active, hits a minimum, and then builds up and becomes highly active again, right? And what we know is that this variation in the activity of the sun corresponds to the strength of the sun's magnetic field, which we've directly measured. It's been, it's been measured in situ um, in the environment between the sun and the earth. Um, and we see other evidence, other indications of it, that as part of this 11 year cycle, the sun becomes less active, more active. And when it's more active, it has a stronger magnetic field as a whole, which helps to shield the, uh, how much cosmic radiation is coming into the solar system from uh, the general galactic environment, right? So this 11 year solar cycle modulates the intensity of galactic cosmic radiation that's coming into the inner solar system and ultimately intersecting the earth and entering the earth's atmosphere. Um, and as we'll talk about in a second, plays a role in cloud formation. And, but this aspect, just the 11 year solar cycle and how the 11 year solar cycle modulates the intensity of the galactic cosmic radiation reaching the earth's atmosphere is well known. There's no debate about it. It's been measured for decades and decades. This is some actual data showing a relation between the daily sunspot counts, again, sunspots being one indication, one, one measure of the solar cycle and the direct cosmic ray flux measured uh, in a station in Moscow over the same, same time period. You see this inverse relation, right? When the sun is stronger, more intense, higher magnetic field, less cosmic rays reaching the Earth's atmosphere. And what was shown by Svensmark and Fris Christensen um, in, the, in the late 90s, kind of kicking off this whole cosmoclimatology uh, new domain of science, was that this 11 year solar cycle seems to sh has a direct correspondence between the rate of cloud formation um, in certain layers of the atmosphere, in particular, low level cloud formation. We had a higher, higher level of uh, solar activity, stronger magnetic field from the sun, that like we just saw, makes it so less galactic cosmic radiation is reaching the, reaching the Earth's atmosphere and uh, results in lower rates of cloud formation. When the sun is less active, when it's in its minimum phase, um, you have uh, more cosmic radiation reaching the atmosphere and that cosmic radiation uh, increases the ionization of the atmosphere creates more charged, electrically charged uh, particles and molecules in the atmosphere, which helps to facilitate the process of them condensing, forming cloud condensation nuclei and, and helping to facilitate the building up and the sustaining and the strengthening of clouds, particular low, lower level clouds. And those in turn then can reflect um, more sunlight when you have higher rates of cloud formation. So this was um, a really important study showing uh, on the 11 year cycle, this direct relation between cloud formation and galactic cosmic radiation flux as a function of what the sun is doing on these time scales. Um, we also see this on longer time scales outside of just uh, decadal time scales outside of the 11 year cycle. The sun also goes into longer periods of lower activity and higher activity. Um, and we see direct relations between uh, climate uh, effects of climate change and what the sun is doing on these timescales. And just to highlight one last example on this, I, I find this useful just to take this all the way down to, you know, we looked at it on timescales of hundreds of millions of years. Uh, we looked at it on time scales of hundreds and thousands of years. We looked at it on time scales of decades, but even on the time scales of days, we see this cosmic radiation effect on the atmosphere, on what water vapor is doing, and on cloud formation. So this was a study by Svensmark, um, a couple of associates near Shaviv, showing uh, how the 
atmospheric conditions and specifically conditions relating to cloud formation change in direct response to very quick, immediate um, changes in the cosmic radiation flux. And these conditions are produced when the sun goes through one of these coronal mass ejections, when there's a large solar flare that spits out a large chunk of plasma in the direction of the earth. People might be familiar with this. This is a concern uh, for the electrical grid of the United States and other countries. It's a whole another subject of discussion that it's been shown that when the sun has these explosive events, um, so-called space weather events, this can, if they're strong enough, can cause all, can wreak all kind of havoc on the electrical systems uh, of the earth. So it's a kind of tangent, but it's worth noting the relation there. Um, but these happen pretty frequently. They're usually not intense enough to have an immediate impact on our electrical infrastructure. Um, and when they when they intersect the earth, uh, like we see depicted here from actual, this is actual data from NASA satellites uh, around the solar system. You have the sun in the very center there, uh, huge solar flare releasing a large coronal mass ejection. And if you can see that blue dot there just to the right of the sun in the center, that's the earth. And this actually happened um, from July 12th to July 15th in 2012. So again, this is actual data from an actual solar flare coronal mass ejection event. And you can see that this um, uh, blew right past the Earth. And when it did, for just a period of a couple days, it really strengthened the um, kind of shielding environment around the Earth that dramatically lowers the amount of cosmic rays coming in from outside the galaxy, from outside the solar system, sorry, from other parts of the galaxy. And so you have this kind of temporary, just for a couple of days, dramatic drop in the cosmic radiation reaching the Earth's atmosphere. This, this also has been known for some time. It's called a four bush decrease, named after the person that discovered it. And what Svensmark and uh, Shaviv and their colleagues showed in this recent paper was that if you look at these events and you look at the, the data from NASA satellites on the Earth's atmosphere, you can see in the immediate days following one of these four bush decreases, this dropping of cosmic rays reaching the atmosphere because of this solar outburst kind of temporary, temporarily increasing the shielding around the earth. You see a, a, a lowering in cloud formation rates. You see a lowering of the, the strength of clouds. You see a lowering of the rate of condensation um, of atmospheric water vapor, right? So even on these short time scales, you see direct evidence um, direct indica indications of this um, cosmoclimatology effect. And here's just an illustration that someone pulled together showing uh, how this cosmic ray flux helps to increase the, 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 the main theory kind of underlying the whole cosmoclimatology area of science, looking at the relation between ionization effects creating cosmic rays creating higher rates of charged particles in the atmosphere, which help to facilitate um, the form formation of cloud condensation nuclei, the building up of clouds, the condensation of water vapor, and so on. And this has also been shown in laboratory experiments pretty extensively now. Um, I'm not gonna go through this just for the sake of time, um, but outside of, I like to start with the actual data we have from historical records, and um, these more recent uh, direct measurements of the atmospheric conditions we just looked at. Um, we also see it in a number of uh, controlled uh, experiments in laboratories of different scales and looking at different conditions. So that brings us back around to what we talked about last week, which is not only using this to better understand the real causes of climate change, but to also look at how we can ourselves control these kinds of effects. And this is something that I worked with, with, with Mr. LaRouche on a number of years ago, and he got really excited about. You know, we talked about it from the standpoint of a galactic perspective on how to handle droughts and water crises. Because that's something he's been on top of for decades, he, he had been on top of for decades and decades and decades, the issue of water um, 
concerns about water shortages, uh, drought conditions, threatening the Western United States, threatening other parts of the world, right? He was very active in this issue, constantly looking for new solutions. Um, you know, we, we had been big proponents. He had been big, a big proponent of large scale water transfer projects, you know, going all the way back to the seventies, um, stuff that we worked with him on uh, 2010, 2011, we revived a lot of that work. And then around, I think it was 2012, 2013, uh, we started really delving into looking at how, in addition to things like desalination, water transfer projects like MOAPA, the North American Water and Power Alliance, you could have uh, a whole new potential of weather modification and weather control using uh, ground-based uh, uh, ionization systems which kind of mimic certain aspects of this cosmic ray effect. So we can control the level of ionization, the type of ionization, the intensity of ionization in particular uh, parts of the lower atmosphere by building these ground-based station, ground stations that run high voltage currents through, um, through wires to create what's called a corona discharge effect, where the, the high voltage running through the wire uh, ionizes the air immediately around it, and that uh, propagate, propagates and spreads, and you create an area of you know tens of square miles where you've increased and affected the um, the ionization conditions of the atmosphere, and that then plays a direct role on how uh, the existing evaporated water in this in that atmosphere uh, condenses and precipitates, eventually precipitates, either it's rain or dew or fog or whatever. Um, so it's a completely new and exciting and, and well demonstrated, again, we talked about this last week, method, method of weather control using these ionization technologies, which really should be seen in the context of this whole science of cosmoclimatology. Looking at a higher understanding of science, science of the climate, how the Earth's climate system evolves in relation to our sun's activity, but ultimately our relation to our position within the galaxy. And there's a lot more that can be said on that, the role of our galaxy in our climate. And uh, there's a whole nother, you know, discussion we could go through on the role of our galaxy and our relation to our galaxy on other factors, including the evolution of life on earth. Um, but this whole galactic frontier, understanding the position of the earth not just as how it relates to the solar system and what the sun's doing and our position around the sun, but also ultimately understanding uh, activity on earth or what's happening on earth all the way down to these clouds we see every single day when we walk outside as expressing a direct immediate relation to our galaxy as a whole, the galactic system as a whole, um, you know, which I think opens up a whole array of new scientific questions. So just to bring this back around, I know we've covered a lot here, um, but I want to reintroduce and conclude with this point on scientific method. And I think what we just went through, you know, a little, a little detailed, but I kind of wanted to put it all in there, uh, gives us the beginning of a, of, of a basis for a, an alternative approach to uh, these kinds of qu questions of climate, climate change uh, and man's relation to it, right? Forget these climate models, forget this modeling, which is really a bottom up, um, you know, ontologically reductionist approach to trying to understand these things and reviving what has been unfortunately a largely lost view of science, a top down approach to scientific method, to epistemology. Again, what some people might call the philosophy of science, right? And Mr. LaRouche would often highlight the, word, highlight the work of Vernatsky as emblematic of this kind of approach. You know, Vernatsky is a great Russian thinker involved in many, many areas of science. He's probably most famously known for his work on the biosphere. And if you read his work on the biosphere, it's a very good introduction to developing a non-reductionist top-down approach to science. Because he goes through all kinds of uh, uh, biogeochemical cycles, how life and living systems 
affect the chemistry of the earth, the chemistry of the atmosphere, the oceans, how they interact, how they interact with the earth's, uh, uh, the, the energy budget, sunlight coming in, photosynthesis converting sunlight, some sun, sunlight energy into um, form of bio, biomolecular energy to fuel the biosphere. A lot of details uh, studying how this, how life interacts with and ultimately defines many of the characteristics of the surface of the earth. But crucially, he didn't just study these as kind of individual parts that kind of added together. He developed this idea of think, studying the biosphere as a totality, as a whole. And he asked questions and he approached questions in ways that, you know, frankly, you don't, most scientists would shy away from today because he wanted to know what the biosphere as a totality, as a whole was doing understanding it as a system as a whole, as a dynamic system, as a totality. And not just trying to reduce and explain away every expression of what the biosphere is or is doing or has done over geological time through the evolution of life, not just trying to reduce that to being explained away by this species action or that species action, which then gets explained away by you know, this molecular activity, that molecular activity, which then gets explained away by this, um, so, you know, this understanding of chemistry and then atomic physics, right? The, the standard reductionist downward direction. He very explicitly uh, in his work, you can see, rejected that approach. And he was interested in studying what is the biosphere doing as the biosphere, right? And he studied, he came up with laws, natural laws uh, of evolution from that standpoint. That if you look at the evolutionary record, you can just say as a totality, life, uh, as expressed through the biosphere, obeys certain laws as, as a totality. For example, the increasing, uh, we, what we today would call increasing energy flux density of the biosphere as a totality, right? That in itself, in, from Vernatsky's standpoint, was a law, a natural uh, law of the biosphere as a whole not just something to be explained away from a reductionist framework, right? So his writings in the biosphere, I think are a good introduction, um, especially looked at from the standpoint of Mr. LaRouche's own work on this subject. Um, and then obviously we have the work of Mr. LaRouche himself uh, in, in the science of physical economy, where he is more explicit than anybody I've ever read in terms of uh, denouncing and going against any kind of reductionist bottom-up approach. Um, this was a big subject for him when he when he fought against a lot of the um, econometric modeling approaches. So people trying to model the economy in a way analogous with how people model the climate today, right? We just try and kind of build up this crazy conglomeration of uh, small-scale effects and interactions and think by that building up from constituent parts higher and higher, you're somehow gonna come up to something that equates to what the economy is doing as a totality, right? He completely rejected that approach, um, fought against it passionately and also as, as what it reflected in terms of more general views of science, which, we, which we're talking about, which we got into here. Um, but he also demonstrated the superiority of his approach, a top-down approach, you know, with his, impeccable record and long-term forecasting of the economy. So in conclusion, you know, I think it's worth highlighting the work of uh, Vernatsky and LaRouche in particular, highlighting their work on the study of the biosphere and the evolutionary development of the biosphere and LaRouche's work on the science of physical economy. And my view is, my thesis is, my, my perspective is that this is really lays the basis for a new direction in science, which is new in a sense, but it's not new in a sense. It's, it's not new in that this, this is repicking up a long history of extremely fruitful and um, demonstrated uh, to be valid uh, approaches to science, which are non-reductionist, top-down, something that's been uh, uh, the subject of attack and, and fight within the scientific, within uh, the history of the, evo with the evolution of modern civilization, re-picking re up that track, that approach to science and the view of mankind's relation 
to the natural world and some of these more challenging questions of epistemology uh, in that context, um, you know, this is not new. This didn't come out of nowhere. In a certain sense, the creation of this country, the creation of uh, modern civilization through the Renaissance, um, and going back further to the classical Greek periods, you know, this has really been tied to and integral to and a key part of the actual progress, the development of modern science, this um, non-reductionist uh, and, and humanist view of science and man's relation to the universe against these reductionist uh, approaches, which that's a whole subject of discussion in itself, how often these are tied to oligarchical systems and imper imperial oligarchical views about human nature and mankind. Um, there's a very strong continuity and interconnectedness there. But this, this scientific perspective needs to be revived. So in a sense, it's not new, but it's also taking it further, taking it into new domains, taking it into new, new frontiers, right? So I think this is part of uh, where we need to go you know, when you take something like the IPCC report and the fight over climate change and what's happening, you have, again, the first layer of kind of straight political propaganda. Yeah, we got to defeat that. We got to, we got to, you know, fight back against that. And, um, you know, it's, it's going to be a challenging fight. We have a strong resistance in the United States to that, thank God. Um, and we got to bolster that and continue that. But at the same time, there's a deeper issue there, uh, reviving a real sane approach to science, abandoning reductionism, um, and really unleashing a new scientific renaissance, uh, which I think Mr. LaRouche's work really provides the best roadmap uh, available today if you, if you really get into his writings. So I'm gonna leave it there. I know that's a lot, um, but I'm sure we got some, some fun questions to, to get into here. <laughs>